Last spring we flooded this forest, and it created a crucial wetland habitat used by fish, amphibians, snails, birds, mammals, and millions of insects. But unfortunately, this explosion of life didn't last. So, what happened here? Why, why is everything so dry? Well, I'm sorry for the suspense, but things are actually going exactly according to plan. Wetland species are thriving, invasives are being pushed back, and we're restoring this area to become an amazing floodplain forest. So, in this video, I want to tell you everything we've learned by showing you around our floodplain forest and also tell you about something which went a bit wrong and how we might be able to fix it for the floods next spring. Now, like any story about the inland delta of the Danube, we need to talk about the flooding cycle. So let me give you a quick reminder of our situation. The Danube is a mighty European river that runs from Germany to the Black Sea. The water it carries varies a lot throughout the year, which leads to regular flooding. And this is something that natural ecosystems have evolved with and they actually require it in order to function properly. So keep that in mind. The area that concerns us is here, just south of Vienna and Bratislava, where there is an inland delta. In this part of the river, the flow splits into a maze of side arms, allowing the water to flood all kinds of areas, which creates some of the most unique and important wetland ecosystems to be found anywhere in the world. As I explained in the last video, this is a floodplain forest emphasis on flood. It's not a lake. The water is not supposed to sort of accumulate and stay here forever. It's supposed to flood and then recede. And that is how this ecosystem works. Well, that is how it should work and how it used to work. And we can see it in action because Slovakia has an amazing collection of old maps and aerial imagery of their country. Looking at this beautiful inland river delta feels bittersweet. On the one hand, I'm struck by how beautiful this rare ecosystem is. And on the other, it makes me sad that now it looks like this. As you know, in the 90s, the Gabachikovo Dam was built here, which diverted most of the water to a concrete channel and almost ruined this entire ecosystem by reducing the water availability to a measly 15% of what it used to be. Luckily for us, the Hungarians did not do the same on their side of the border due to environmental pressure even though this has led to a court case between Hungary and Slovakia in the International Court of Justice. Regardless of the history, the dam is now built and the damage is done, but there's still something left to save. And Broz, our amazing partners, are trying to make the most of it by performing what can only be described as water miracles to keep some of this biodiversity alive for future generations. And of course, this is also the main reason why we at Mossy Earth decided to help them flood a forest. So now that we have refreshed your memory, let's take a look at the timeline of our project so you can see what has happened since we got started. The digging of the channel began at the end of February. We built the channel from here to here with the goal of flooding these two areas. Now, I have to point out that these floodplain forests used to flood from down here actually, not from upstream. This is visible in all the old maps, and the reason it's no longer possible is of course because the water level is 4 meters lower than it used to be before the dam was built. So in a way, our channel being built from up here is a bit of a compromise solution, but it's the only way we're going to be able to flood these areas. Then in this map here, you can see a simulation of the terrain using a digital elevation model, which helps us evaluate how water will accumulate in the area. And in May, like it does every year, the Danube started to swell in size and the dam management company let some water into the old Danube system. After a bit of time passed, our wetland started to slowly fill in, and when it was fully flooded, the Bros team celebrated by enjoying what they built. So it was nice to see that it's real the plans, what we did, what we what I calculated and everything, that it really works. And when we you can walk here in this in this area full of the water with the with this with this boots and see that okay the the, the maps it was not lying. I finally visited the area in the beginning of June and I showed you around in the last video. As you saw, many of the key species we wanted to see return were there already. The first and most notable thing was the singing of the amphibians, followed of course by the buzzing of the mosquitoes, which are food for everything here. And then once you started looking a bit deeper, you could see the water snails had returned too. And of course, crucially for us, the water was full of fish. 
they essentially used these forest areas as a nursery for their young. And after the dam was built, these areas became very rare, leading to a 75% reduction of the fish populations. So we were really happy to see our forest do its job. Then around the 15th of July, as we were celebrating 1 million views on our wetland video, I got this message from Adriana with some more good news. They had found a Pannonian rootful in our area, which is an endangered subspecies that this project targets. That was the cherry on top of the cake for us. And I'll explain later why this matters so much. The flood and this explosion of life lasted all the way to the end of July, when the water management company unfortunately turned the tap off. We'll get into why this is a bad thing in a bit, when we discuss the long-term effects. Now, before we continue along this timeline, I want to show you how the wetland looks like right now, because the species that live here tells the story of the battle for the heart of our wetland. And I also think some of these plants are really unique and different. So let's start with something simple that you might recognize. This here is Humulus lupulus. And you can see that it is familiar to you because this is what they use to make beer and to give it taste. And I really love it because uh, the IPAs, which are my favorite beer, taste a lot like this. So when I squeeze this, it smells exactly like a lovely beer that I had yesterday in Bratislava. So this here is Datura Stramonium, otherwise known as Devil's Snare. This is Devil's Snare. You have to relax. Well, not that one. This one here won't try to kill you. Well, unless you eat it, of course, because it does have some crazy hallucinogenic properties and it isn't, I think, very healthy to consume large amounts of it. But it is a really interesting plant and it is a part of our wetland here. And here on the edge of our channel, we have the humble blackberry. But it can be a bit of a problem in wetland areas as it's quite expansive, it can be quite dominant. And what's really missing here are the bigger grazers which would come in and get rid of a lot of these plants. So that's a missing piece that maybe one day we'll try to fix in this wetland. And this here I believe is a plant called Cardus. And it's a really interesting native species because it sticks to things which means it is able to get around and spread over really large areas. And now let's go take a look at the protagonists of our wetland. The plants I've showed you so far are mostly a curiosity, because the main conflict in our wetland is the battle between invasive species, which dominates the dry fields in our area, and the classic wetland species that belong here. Let's start with the good guys, the wetland species. These here are Phragmites, which are a kind of reed, and they're one of the first species that we want to see return to our wetlands, because they're habitat forming. And the best way to see them, actually, is to go really up high and see everything from above, to understand exactly how they've spread through this whole area. As you can see from up here, Phragmites have mostly spread around our channel, in the areas not shaded by the forest but we do expect them to move to the edges of the forest in the long run. The other protagonists of our wetlands are the Carex species. Nice sign of uh, uh, ecological change. Yeah, the, the, you see that it was like here, you still have, you see even the teeth of the, of the machine. Yeah. <laughs> but over there is finally see the, the Carex species. Yeah. Jakub also got some extra plants from another area where we are starting a new wetland project and planted them along the channel to help boost the natural regeneration. So why do we care so much about these species? Well, it's because they're really important habitat for a variety of wetland mammals. So the small mammals that could use this uh, wetland would be for sure the root vole, uh, the subspecies Microtus economus meheli, also the shrews, for example, Sorex uh, araneus, Sorex minutus, or Crocidura, we have Crocidura suavellens and Crocidura leucodon. The Pannonian root vole in particular is an endangered subspecies that lives in the area since the last glaciation, and it's having a tough time these days due to many new invasive species. It is one of the critters that needs wetlands, so when researchers from Comenius University found a pregnant female right next to our wetland, this was really good news for all of us. During our visit now, we decided to tag along with one of the researchers to go to another area and see the trapping process ourselves. The bridge is connected to a wire, so when we close it, it's like this, and when the animal crosses the bridge, the wire will move a little bit and the trap will close. So it's really easy and really efficient. And usually the 
like oats or flower worms are put inside for the animals to survive till the next uh, check. Mm -hmm. ah, so you put food along with it, so yes. it's, a, it's got a nice day. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Accommodation, all you can eat. <laughs> yeah, all you can eat buffet. <laughs> we really like the reporting structure of this project because we have a third party, in this case the researchers from the university, verify and report on the outcomes of our project. Before we move on to what went wrong, I would just like to remind you that we fund this work through our Mossy Earth membership. Our members pay monthly to restore wild ecosystems across a wide variety of projects, ranging from tree planting in Iceland to bringing back kelp forests in the sea all the way to restoring an old quarry. We report on all of this using these videos, but also through our app and Discord server, where you can chat with the team. The price to join the membership is pretty cheap, so if these projects are something you'd like to support, then please consider checking out mossy.earth. The link is in the description and in a pinned comment down below. Now let's take a look at some of the challenges that our wetland faces. This is some kind of solidago species, and it's invasive and really dominant but it doesn't like water, which means when we restart the wetlands, they actually start disappearing. And they've been reducing in this area right here, which is a great sign. And then on the other side here, I've got another one of our, of our enemies, which is called Astra Belgica. I believe it's a New York aster from my Googling, I concluded that. And it's another one that behaves in a very similar way. And it's these kinds of plants that we hope will disappear when we normalize the flooding regime in our wetlands. This end here is another challenge for our wetland because as the water is moving down the channel, it gets to these points and it goes underground. And of course that means it stops flooding the surrounding areas. And there isn't much really that we can do, but clay accumulation is really important. And our colleagues at Bros believe that clay will accumulate here over the next few years. And this will allow the floods to stay for longer and extend into areas that are further and further down the wetlands. So those two problems are sorting themselves mostly, which leads us to the next part of our wetland. This here is the bottom end of our channel, and the water here floods this beautiful old willow grove. These trees are Salix alba, which is a species of willow, and they love water, but they haven't had much of it in the last few decades. So our channel brought them that for the first time in a really long time, and it also brought with it loads of nutrients, which are really important for them. And for those among you who sort of doubted that trees should be flooded, look at them, they love it. I can promise you, willows love having wet feet and they especially love having a bit of flooding and then a dry period, which is exactly how these forests are supposed to be. Another species that our project here is trying to help is Bombina bombina, which is a species of toad known as the European fire-bellied toad, which is a really cool name for, for a toad, actually. And they make this super funny sound that you heard in the last video. They're so loud and it creates this insane environment that you really understand that you're in a wetland. But unfortunately, what happened here was that they had a bit of a short season. The water wasn't here long enough for them to reproduce as much as they needed. And that's something that we would love to change for the next few years. And Broz is working hard with the water management people here from the Gavachikovo Dam to try and make sure that we get a bit more water into this system so that the area can stay flooded for longer. I'm really curious and excited to see what will happen here in our wetlands in the spring when it floods again. And remember, if you want to support this work and all the other projects that we do, then the best you can do for us is become a member at mossy.earth and help us fund these interventions for years to come. A big thank you to all of you for making this work possible. Until next time. Cheers!